Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, and thank you for joining us today. My name is Zach Ford. I use he, him pronouns, and I am going to be your host and your moderator for today's event. I'm a senior program manager at Age United, where I have the great honor of overseeing our harm reduction portfolio, including the Syringe Access Fund. Age United is a nonprofit organization. We're based in Washington, DC, and our mission is to end the HIV epidemic in the United States. Our work falls into three primary categories, grant making, policy and advocacy, and capacity building. And the Syringe Access Fund is one of our oldest grant making initiatives. Age United began managing the Syringe Access Fund in 2004. It is a collaborative funding initiative, and I really look forward to sharing more about it in just a few minutes. Age United decided to host this event because the COVID pandemic has really highlighted gaps in our existing healthcare infrastructure. Syringe access fund grantees and other syringe services programs have been challenged long before the COVID pandemic began. These providers face the same stigma as the communities they serve. Consistently ignored by traditional health systems and federal aid, they've been chronically underfunded and persistently undervalued, ignored as legitimate healthcare systems in some states and outlawed in others. Today's conversation is going to shine a spotlight on syringe services programs, the communities they serve, and the broad range of services they provide, helping us understand the role they play in the healthcare landscape and the institutional barriers they face. We will hear from leaders of syringe services programs and those supporting and funding this critical work. We've set aside time at the end for Q&A, and we invite you to submit questions through the Q&A function. My colleague Kelly Stevens is moderating the Q&A box and will be compiling questions for us throughout the presentation and panel discussions. And we know there are many folks here today who know each other, so please feel free to use the chat function to say hello and share information and resources. We have a lot to cover in a short amount of time, and so let's dig in. We're facing significant issues that threaten our collective health and well being. Whether you are focused on unemployment, overdose, or affordable housing, these issues intersect and they impact one another. Overdose mortality was on the rise in 2019, and it increased even further during COVID, with rates rising 20% between June of 2019 and June of 2020 to over 81,000 lives lost. That is the greatest number of fatal overdoses ever recorded in a single year. In 2015, HIV diagnoses due to injection drug use increased for the first time in 20 years. Today, 10% of new HIV diagnoses are attributed to injection drug use. And 60% of new hepatitis C cases in the US are directly or indirectly related to injection drug use. COVID is a particular risk to people who use drugs, who may have conditions that exacerbate disease severity or progression, such as compromised lungs or cardiovascular systems. And a National Institutes of Health study found that those living with a substance use disorder are more likely to acquire COVID and are more likely to experience worse outcomes. In August, the CDC released a study showing that US adults reported considerably elevated adverse mental health conditions associated with COVID. 13.3% of respondents reported having started or increased substance use to cope with stress or emotions related to COVID. A 2020 Quest Diagnostics Health Trends study indicates that misuse of fentanyl, heroin, and non-prescribed opioids are on the rise, potentially due to the COVID pandemic's impact on healthcare access and support for individuals most at risk for substance use disorder. One piece of the study that is important to highlight is that positivity for non-prescribed fentanyl increased substantially among specimens that were also positive for amphetamines, benzodiazepines, and cocaine. The Quest findings are consistent with overdose trends. According to a 2021 study by the National Institute on Drug Abuse, methamphetamine-involved overdose deaths surged in an eight-year period in the United States. 
Findings indicate that deaths involving methamphetamines more than quadrupled among American Indians and Alaskan Natives overall. The study indicates long-term decreased access to education, high rates of poverty, and discrimination in the delivery of health services are among factors thought to contribute to health disparities for American Indians and Alaskan Natives. Which is not surprising, given our nation's history of racist drug policies. In 2018, the highest increase in rates of overdose deaths were among Black men. By the end of 2018, nearly half of all people who injected drugs and were living with HIV were Black. People of color experience discrimination at every stage of the criminal legal system. This is particularly the case for drug law violations. Nearly 80% of people in federal prison and almost 60% of people in state prison for drug offenses are Black or Latino. And research shows that prosecutors are twice as likely to pursue a mandatory minimum sentence for Black people as for white people charged with the same offense. And yet, we are still layering the healthcare system for people who use drugs with barriers to quality, comprehensive services. Healthcare practitioners face significant obstacles in treating patients with buprenorphine due in part to the X waiver requirement. To prescribe buprenorphine, practitioners must notify SAMHSA of their intent, a hurdle that many practitioners do not or will not clear. Methadone, which is taken daily, must be dispensed under the supervision of a practitioner. These restrictions have been relaxed during COVID, but SAMHSA has not indicated whether they will continue post-pandemic. I want you to imagine for a moment that you have a chronic medical condition that requires daily medication and that you have to go to your provider's office every single morning to receive your dosage. We make it more difficult to obtain medication for opioid use disorder than to get a prescription for opioids or buy fentanyl or heroin on the street. And meanwhile, the bulk of federal funds fo focus on opioid use alone, which ignores that the overdose crisis is increasingly characterized by polysubstance use, with rising deaths involving stimulants. The legality of syringe services programs in the U.S. is a patchwork of laws, ranging from full statewide legalization to full statewide bans. And there is no dedicated federal funding stream for community-based syringe services. In fact, we have a federal funding ban on syringes. For decades, we've addressed substance use in two main ways, demand reduction and supply reduction. Demand reduction seeks to reduce the demand for drugs in the manner of the Just Say No anti-drug campaign of the 1980s and 1990s. And supply reduction seeks to reduce the drug supply and is the premise of the war on drugs, which has led to over-criminalization, mass incarceration, and fractured communities. As my previous slides demonstrate, neither strategy is working. The reality is that people are using drugs, and it will doubtless continue. In contrast to these approaches, harm reduction focuses on positive change and on working with people without judgment, coercion, discrimination, or requiring that they stop using drugs as a precondition of support. Harm reduction refers to policies, programs, and practices that aim to minimize negative health, social, and legal impacts associated with drug use and drug laws. To meet people where they're at, Harm reduction incorporates a spectrum of strategies from safer use to managed use to abstinence, addressing conditions of use along with the use itself. And one of the most effective harm reduction interventions we have are syringe services programs, commonly called SSPs. SSPs are associated with an estimated 50% reduction in HIV and hepatitis C. A 2018 study by the Yale School of Public Health found that the HIV outbreak in Scott County, Indiana in 2015 could have been avoided with comprehensive syringe services. When the, H when the out outbreak occurred, syringe services were illegal in the state of Indiana. Researchers found that earlier action could have brought the actual number of infections from 215 to 10. But SSPs go beyond addressing the need for sterile injection supplies. They provide a broad range of linkage and support services for participants who have been pushed out or left out of traditional healthcare services. And 
they're cost effective. <clears throat> The impact of an expansion of SSPs in New York City was studied from 1990 to 2002. During this time, syringe distribution in New York City increased significantly from 250,000 to 3 million syringes per year. Researchers found that HIV prevalence among people who inject drugs declined from 50% to 17%. An evaluation of the impact of syringe services legalization in the District of Columbia showed a 70% decrease in new HIV cases among people who inject drugs and a total of 120 HIV cases averted in two years. A cost effectiveness analysis estimated that a $10 million annual investment by the US government in SSPs would result in 194 HIV infections averted in one year, a lifetime treatment cost savings of $75.8 million, and a return on investment of $7.58 for every $1 spent. A 2009, 2019 study in Philadelphia and Baltimore demonstrated that SSPs prevented a total of 12,483 new cases of HIV over a 10-year period. In 1988, Opponents of syringe services added a provision to the funding bill for the Department of Health and Human Services that prohibited the use of federal funds for supporting SSPs, claiming without any scientific evidence that they led to increases in drug use. The federal funding ban is still partially in effect. No federal funds can be used to purchase syringes or cookers. The syringe access fund was created because of this funding ban. It is a funding collaborative of the Elton John AIDS Foundation, H. Van Emmeringen Foundation, Levi Strauss Foundation, and AIDS United. The goal of the Syringe Access Fund is to reduce the health, psychosocial, and socioeconomic disparities experienced by people who use drugs. We accomplish this by investing in evidence-based and community-driven approaches to prevent the transmission of both HIV and viral hepatitis, reduce injection-related injuries, increase overdose prevention and reversal efforts, and connect people who use drugs to comprehensive prevention, treatment, and support services. The Syringe Access Fund recognizes and acknowledges that people do not live single-issue lives. We believe that we have an obligation to identify and support innovative strategies that seek to support people in all aspects of their lives. Increases in substance use leads to additional intersecting issues. Syringe services programs operate at this intersection, providing life-saving healthcare services to marginalized communities around the country. People who use drugs access services that reduce the harms associated with substance use. They also enter a community of care that provides respect, dignity, and access. Here we have an anecdote from a Grand P, Grand T report that reads, when T, a program participant, first showed up, he had no housing, no access to food, poor personal hygiene, and was using heavily. By establishing a comfortable environment and personal relationship, we were able to connect him to health insurance, housing assistance, food, and ultimately treatment for substance use disorder. He started the program barely able to stay awake during the intake process and ended up actively involved in his recovery. And that's because SSPs provide warm handoff referrals and intensive navigation, social, medical and support services, overdose prevention, and advocacy. They are highly skilled and well positioned to serve communities that many consider hard to reach, but who are actually hardly reached and provide tailored medical care linkage to retention and reengagement in care services. And now we have a short video for you. Meet Tess. Tess is a 26 year old woman who has been living in an encampment for six months. Tess has been homeless ever since the loss of her job left her unable to make rent. She has been using heroin for six years, a self-medicating pain regimen that started after a car crash left her with chronic back and neck pain. Tess recently took a home pregnancy test and it was positive. A friend she made at the encampment suggested she check out the mobile syringe exchange that stops by three times a week. Wary of sharing her substance use with strangers, her friend assured her they could be trusted. Why don't you check out the exchange can later this week? I'm sure they'd be able to help. Are you sure? that they're safe to talk to. I don't want to risk getting in trouble. 
Don't worry, Tess. They're some of the nicest people I've ever met. They are really caring and truly just want to help. Tess watched the next day as the mobile syringe exchange pulled up at the homeless encampment. A line formed outside the van, with folks being greeted warmly and being offered snacks and drinks while they waited. Several people Tess knew held orange sharps containers that they were giving to the syringe exchange staff. Tess approached the line and decided to test the waters by asking for some injection supplies and naloxone. Hi there. Welcome to City Recovery Alliance. I don't think we've met. My name is Amanda. Hello. I'm really glad to see you today. If you're new, I just need you to answer a couple questions so I can make sure you get everything you need. After several trips to the mobile syringe exchange, Tess began to trust Amanda enough to open up about her positive pregnancy test. Amanda recommended she come into their brick and mortar location and speak with the RN that comes in twice a week. Hi, my name is Michael, and I'm a registered nurse who volunteers with City Recovery Alliance twice a week. It's nice to meet you, Tess. Michael is able to confirm Tess's pregnancy and provide a month's supply of prenatal vitamins. Michael also tests Tess for viral hepatitis, HIV, and STIs. Michael notices an abscess on Tess that looks infected and treats it on the spot. Thanks for coming in today, Tess. Is there anything else that you need today? Tess is concerned about her heroin use and its effect on the baby. Michael understands and talks to Tess about her options. City Recovery Alliance has a program that connects people to medication for opioid use disorder that sounds appealing to Tess. Thanks, Michael. I'll see you in two weeks. Tess's test results came back positive for HIV. Michael was able to connect her to the local AIDS service organization, which helped with Medicaid paperwork and connecting her to treatment. Tess is then connected with the patient navigation program and began buprenorphine treatment. She was able to stop her heroin use for the duration of her pregnancy. City Recovery Alliance connected her with an OBGYN that was able to provide quality and consistent care to her and the baby. Everything looked great today, Tess. The baby is developing normally. Can I schedule an appointment for you in two weeks? City Recovery Alliance also connected Tess to a housing advocate that was able to place her in a women's shelter. Tess connected with several other new moms and joined a support group for women living with HIV. The scenario in the video may seem far-fetched to you, but this type of care happens every single day at syringe services programs around the country. Three weeks ago, I was on a monthly check-in call with a grantee. They told me about an SSP participant who enrolled in their patient navigation program for medication for opioid use disorder. The participant was pregnant and wanted to transition from heroin and fentanyl to buprenorphine or methadone. Our grantee connected her to a provider and got her started on medication. A few months later, she lost her means of transportation, which meant she was not going to be able to make it to her provider, a barrier that would result in a return to heroin and fentanyl. Our grantee stepped in and began providing transportation to her appointments. That participant recently delivered a happy and healthy baby and is continuing with her treatment. The things that you see listed on the screen, these programs and activities, these are all offered by syringe access fund grantees. Staff and volunteers at SSPs do this every day and the syringe access fund helps them. In February of 2018, the Syringe Access Fund awarded two-year grants to 54 syringe services programs, a total investment of $1.9 million. Utilizing the return on investment of $7.58 for every $1 spent, our $1.9 million investment had a $15.2 million return on investment. Of the $1.9 million awarded, half went directly to the purchase of harm reduction supplies. During the two-year funding period, grantees distributed more than 66 million syringes to over 135,000 unique participants. But syringe access fund resources are dwindling. In round 11, we were only able to disperse $675,000 in grants. During the global COVID pandemic, our grantees averaged 31 hours of syringe services operation per week, demonstrating their dedication to providing consistent health services to their communities. Grantees in the first six month, months of their award 
distributed more than 66,000 doses of naloxone, referred more than 1,200 people to HIV testing and or treatment, and connected over 750 people to substance use disorder treatment services. Demand for their services is going up and resources are desperately needed. So what can we do? We are now going to hear from a panel of syringe services programs leaders who will provide additional information and context about these critical health systems. And so now I'll invite the first group of panelists to join me on video. Uh, so Rafi, Mark, Phoebe. Hello, it's great to see you all. Um, so we're joined today by three amazing panelists who are going to share about their experiences running syringe services programs. Um, and I think we can do a round of introductions and we will start with you, Phoebe. Buju Indinui Manaduk. Um, my name is Philomena Quebec. I work with Guayacopa Montezu and Bad River Needle Exchange. And I just have some, um, just a really short thing I, I was gonna um, share. Is, is this a good time to do this right now? Or are we gonna do, okay. Um, and so we, we have a syringe program that's way in the north um, of Wisconsin. I'm from Bad River, um, Bad River Band of Lake Superior Chippewa. We're, we're people that live on the southern shore of Lake Superior and um, we have a mobile syringe program. This is um, a meeting that I had with, with one of our participants about an hour south of here. I drove down there and then provided her with, with um, a bunch of supplies because she serves a whole community of people in an area that does not have any access to, um, to any kind of services that are specific for people who inject drugs. So, you know, what we do, um, this is our, this is our flag and um, it, it's actually also a depiction of our reservation, which is about 125,000 acres of incredible gorgeousness um, right on the southern shore of Lake Superior in northern Wisconsin. And so, you know, we, we do like our, our bread and butter of our work is to provide low barrier syringe services to people in our community. Um, we serve a pretty big area. We, we go to Michigan a little bit. Um, hey, we, Phoebe, uh, yeah. sorry, yeah. I don't mean to interrupt you, um, but we're seeing uh, a document instead of the photos. Oh, Jesus. Okay, I'm sorry about that. No worries. Sorry. <sighs> okay, here we go. I'm, I apologize. Is this, no, you're are fine. you not seeing the right document? Yeah, we are. Okay, great. Here is, um, so, so here's, you know, here's, here's the, here's the work that I was doing with that really nice young lady the other day. Um, we were getting a whole bunch of materials together for her. And, um, and so again, here's the depiction of our, here's our flag, um, our nation's flag, and it, it shows our reservation. Um, and you know the different connections that we have to each other and then to the to the world that we live in um, so we do you know we do some work with folks um, we have a mobile program and also drop-in services um, in our homes um, and then we you know provide the you know the injection equipment and and overdose prevention but we also do what we call social support and that's really about providing that that warm contact with folks because i think that's really what what they need um and and it's also very fulfilling for um for us um our work is is really guided by our traditions in our community and and it's about um expressing those those values and 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 addressing drug use in our community, even problematic drug use with our own traditional values that are that are not about punishment, but really about meeting people where they're at with love, respect, humility, truth, courage, wisdom, and honesty. And, um, you know, and so we're, we're really happy to participate in this. Um, thank you so much to all the all the folks who've supported this work. 
we're, we're really humbled by the, um, you know, by, by all the support that we've had. So I'm going to end now. But I just wanted to um, provide you with just a little, some pictures about, you know, this work that we do. Oh, thank you, Phoebe. That was uh, fantastic. I always really love, love seeing photos. Um, I think we will go to Mark next uh, to introduce himself and, and his organization. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Zach, uh, for allowing us to participate in, in this event. Uh, as I said, my name is Mark Jenkins. I'm the father and executive director of the Greater Hartford Harm Reduction Organization. We are Connecticut's uh, only harm reduction organization by mission, vision, and value. Uh, and as such, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm humbled to be a, a part of this call because the advancement, I will say, of making harm reduction, uh, I use the word palatable, uh, a little more palatable in the state because we have all of the documentation. We have all of the numbers and everything to support how effective you show that uh, uh, our work is, but uh, it, it's not always accepted still. Um, so through the use or, or of funding from Age United uh, from Coma Foundation, uh, you know, we have been able to take an organization pretty much that started in the back of uh, a Chevy Astro minivan with primarily myself uh, to a, a vibrant organization that, that is a part of the advocacy policy and the advancement of harm reduction best practices in the state of Connecticut. Our Rover, which was developed with funds from Age United is now the best practice uh, for, or the chosen method for syringe service expansion in the state of Connecticut. There's now over 20 of them in use throughout the state of Connecticut. Uh, you know, we, if the video you showed would be a mirror image of the work that we do on a daily basis. And, uh, you know, needless to say that, uh, you know, we're used to having a little and, and making a lot. Uh, so I, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time, you know, I, I will say that, you know, it's, we as syringe service providers, harm reduction organizations have a pulse of the community. Uh, and as, as such, we're better suited to reach into to this, this work. I, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm gonna cut it short because <laughs> I'm stammering and uh, leave some room for Rafi. Thanks, Mark. It's really great to have you here today. Appreciate it. Uh, Rafi? Hey, saludo y gracias por la oportunidad. My name is Rafi Torruella. Um, thank you for the opportunity of being here and, and wonderful panelists and, and this opportunity. Um, so my name is Rafi Torruella. As I mentioned, I have the honor of being executive director of, uh, I guess, unapologetically harm reduction organization uh, on the eastern side of Puerto Rico. Um, and we, we, we are proud to say harm reduction, but also say low threshold service organization, full outreach organization, an organization that's also engaged in, in, in sensible drug policy, changing drug policy, because we understand that if it's important that people who are, have been marginalized need to take on the, the, take, take on the control over their own health, 
through our assistance and, and, and solidarity, it's really also important to change policies who criminalize uh, drug users. Because you, know, you don't criminalize drugs, you criminalize drug users, right? So in a way, that's also part of, of our mission, our vision, and if you would, our business, right? Um, Intercambio started 10 years ago uh, as a small um, a harm reduction organization out of actually a mark out of, out of a Toyota Yaris. So it's a very small car. You, you, you had an Astro van, I, you know? So, and, and this is a, also a consistent story of it because we start out of very much of a passion because you see social inequity, you see something that it can be resolved easily, but it can be addressed easily. It can be intervened once you have the right lens on it, once you get the science of it, know the interventions of it, and have the respect, as very much Phoebe said, the respect of the organization, the sorry, the, of, of the participants, and so you can really engage. Then it, 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 it is a science, it is an intervention, but it's also so much of, of love and the feel of engaging with community. For us, the Syringe Access Fund was that first pot of funding that could we, we could plant a flag and say, this is where we start from. This is what, what, what is going to guide us. And from there, from solidifying what was a one, two spot syringe exchange program, now it's a, about 21 community syringe exchange program around 13 municipalities on the eastern side of Puerto Rico. So now, now we gotta, we're, we're, we're providing services and we're beholden to a lot of people that expect our services that way for us because if we don't deliver the syringes, if we don't deliver, uh, deliver the case management, if we don't do HIV testing, no one will. I mean, through hurricanes, through COVID, regardless, we, we are basically the sole providers because other people, as you were said, uh, SAC, uh, it, the people who use drugs are not hard to reach for us. It, it is our community. So we're right there with them. Um, so they're actually expecting us. They call and say, where you're at, you're 15 minutes late. I'm here waiting for you. And that, that, that is the level at which we operate in, and that's how connected we are. So if somebody falls, quote unquote, out of care, we're right there uh, with them. We can know where to find them. We know their family. So, so, so it's very engaging. Um, after the syringe ex access fund uh, helped us structure uh, the syringe exchange program, then we were able to, you know, solidify ourselves to score then a, a, an HIV grant uh, with the local Department of Health to do HIV testing, get our RN and a case manager on staff. Then we did a little bit more policy tapping, you know, other foundations like Open Society Foundation helped me push this forward with policy. Then we went back to services and suddenly SAMHSA was gained for us to, to then provide more services to homeless individuals. Then NASDAQ came in with another CDC grant, right? So suddenly that, that syringe access fund um, basic grant help us solidify and from there establish a very solid relationship and programmatic base so we can extend our, our gaze to more complex and better services and then engage policy way more directly. And now we're hopefully going to scale up to, to clinical services pretty soon. But I'll stop there because I really want to leave more time for our engagement and our discussion. Yeah, thank you all so much. And you all hit on on so many things that I really want to kind of like dig into a little bit deeper here. And so I want to start by by really what you were just talking about, Rafi, that, you know, the syringe piece of a syringe services program is critical. Um, you know, the, the syringes prevent infectious disease transmission. They act as a tool of engagement of uh, bringing folks into that community of care. Um, once someone begins to engage with with y'all's programs, what other types of resources do you offer, and what and what sorts of resources are you seeing as like highest need right now? Um, and whoever wants to jump in, go for it. Well, right now, I'll say unequivocally, uh, the, the largest need I see right now is space, uh, a space where people can convene. On, on different levels because of the social distancing guidelines. Uh, we know there's just space. Uh, you know, we have already marginalized populations uh, that have been pushed further uh, in, in, into uh, areas that, you know, sometimes between that and, and the disruption of encampments that we're just not able to reach them so really you know some space because churches you know are not open soup kitchens here 
are doing grab and goes, uh, you know, how we've had to develop into giving out sandwiches. We'd, we'd give out over 500 sandwiches a week. And we've managed to still keep our brick and mortar site open to do one person to two people at a time, but a space where, you know, even in the midst of all of this severe cold weather, uh, very little space for people to, to go. So the development of, of some space where people can meet, you know, across the board uh, in various settings is, is, is so necessary. Rafi, Phoebe, what are y'all seeing? So you made me think there. So <laughs> I, I, I want to give you top three. Well, there, there are more syringes are going on though than ever, right? Um, I, I was just checking on, on some numbers yesterday and it's a 30% increase and it, 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 it's hard to keep up. So that's one, but you said more than syringes. One of our big ones is transportation, even through COVID, but regardless, if we look at the social determinants of health here in Puerto Rico, we're talking about transportation, transportation, transportation. It's, it, and, and it's mainly to, and I would say number two, access evidence-based treatment, not just treatment, treatment, but evidence-based treatment, not just treatment that will treat you bad or tell you that will just shape up or, or get your life in, none of that scolding. It's evidence-based where we can address issues by biocycle, social interventions, grounded in very cultural, rich, very real interventions, right? Um, getting evidence-based biopsychosocial interventions here through transportation, those two are huge. And, and there, people are increasing now. When, when our lives get dislodged, either by a hurricane, by COVID, by earthquakes, whatever have you, um, people want change. And we should be ready to address that change immediately. Treatment first, just like, like, like housing first, um, which is many times not really housing first. Um, so I would say transportation, access to evidence base, and then the lock zone. It, it, th those three things now in very high demand. And, and people, particip problem participants might not go to any quote unquote drug treatment center or, or place of help and say, can you take me there and make sure I get in? But they do come to us because we do have that respect um, in both ways. We respect their lives and their life decisions and their respect where we refer them to because we know it's not going to be a place where they got going to get criminalized or yelled at just because who they are. So I would say transportation, access to evidence base, pardon, and um, overdose prevention and naloxone. I, you know, our program is is really smaller um, because we we're, we're in a very we're in a smaller community out in the sticks, and um, so we really work on leveraging community engagement. And um, and so for the past, I, I think about five years, we've had this community soup program where um, we have just neighbors making soup for neighbors, and it gets stored in my garage with the rest of the syringe. Um, services and so we can always provide people with really wholesome nutritious food um, and and people get a lot out of that they appreciate the the care and compassion that comes with getting some you know getting food um, it, you know the the hard part is we have people who are unhoused and it's always tricky kind of working through the frozen soup situation with people who are unhoused um, you know, I really, I, I agree with Mark. It's It's been so difficult with the lack of space and warmth that people have. Um, over the, over the past weekend, we had a, we had a program participant pass away of an overdose and exposure because um, we don't have any kind of safe injection facilities and we don't have a warming shelter. We have nothing in our community related to that, and um, and so you know we're we're continuing to we haven't we haven't shut down our services one bit with with COVID. Um, we're con we've we've continued throughout to um, you know respond to the respond to the needs of our of our community, and um, you know it's it's like our our syringe. Um, we've gone through forty percent more syringes this year. Um, and, and so it's, I mean, the demand has increased exponentially. What we're really working on in our program 
right now on kind of a sort of a programmatic level is to um, I, I would like to see our program run entirely by by people who have lived experience and so you know working on working on um, mentoring folks and and teaching them about all the different operational mechanisms that make this syringe program work and effective um, I would like them to have full employment and and housing stability and security as many of our participants as possible to be able to you know not only reap the rewards of this program but also um, but also be directing the policy initiatives and and be directing the service provision because you know that's that's when we're going to see a, a very effective program, you know. So we we do you know we do, we do the stuff in, in terms of referrals. Like we'll, we have we have certain doctors who are really good and who are we're providing evidence based care. Um, the wait time to get in is very long because we don't have enough of these providers, you know. And so we experience some some barriers that are are maybe unique to this rural situation and speak to some some urgent changes that we we need in in that X waiver process. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all to all of you. Um, something that kind of came up across responses um, that I want to tease out a little bit for folks who might be joining us that are new to harm reduction, new to syringe services, um, is this concept of, of lived experience and meaningful involvement. Um, I mean, I think it's it's something that has come up in all of your responses to everything that's been posed today. And so, um, you know, I think those of us who who are have been in harm reduction for a while know that that that's really critical and important. But I want to hear from you all what what is so valuable about having your programs be led by people who use drugs or people with lived experience of drug use. Um, what's the what's the kind of critical piece there? Uh, I, I guess I'll, I'll jump in. Um, I, I guess I'll go first. You know, when we uh, were able to open up uh, our first site uh, was in an, uh, an area predominantly African-American and Latino, uh, having done some work in that community for a while, uh, you know, we, we, I decided to go with gatekeepers from that community. Uh, as, as a result, you know, of that, then just the, the empathy, uh, the ability to reach further in the community, uh, the non judgmental level of service delivery just when I tell you and in our first year, not even our first year because we opened in 2018 on Overdose Awareness Day, uh, the sheer number of individuals we engaged and served uh, to the end of the year were over 600 uh, unique intakes. Uh, I believe it was over 12,000 visits. You know, the, the pop just, it has changed everything even to a point after COVID hit that our RV was asked by the city to post at the hotel where when they diverted the shelters for social distancing, that they still had some people or individuals that they knew could engage the populations uh, and, and get in there. I, I can't tell you, uh, you know, now we've had to sense add on to that space to meet the need. And uh, 
I don't think much of that, it, it, even right now, I, I don't want to point a finger because we, we, there are other larger agencies that have recently, you know, received money to do similar work. But like even today, it came up on a governor's call. Uh, they didn't know some very basic services within their own community, but they got the money. So it's like the usual suspects getting the money when you have people right there that are much better suited to provide the services and make the service connections, but it goes by us, you know, and I don't want to call names, but you know, that's just, that's just the way it is. So Mark, thank you for that because yeah, same, same here. There's so much to be done. Uh, some entities get huge grants and then you see them scrambling for connections with the community. And, and that's well and good, but the, the problem is that there's so many of us already poised that know these people intimately and know it, and and then it just goes and and and, and the money that for for other folks they don't get it they don't they don't really know the lives of people who use drugs homeless individuals or people who who do sex work right so but let me go Zach going back to to your question regarding lives experience I guess. For, for us at Intercambios is also putting our work our, our and, and the funds that, that we are able to get where our mouths are, right? So if we, we are to, in a way, empower people, not only because of their, uh, they need to be empowered of, of their own health, but we also want to talk uh, peer to peer. So people who have that lived experience that have used heroin can talk to another person that have, has used heroin that has gone through the same life circumstances in a way that other people cannot, right? So, so is that very specific uh, way an intervention can be structured that cuts through the stigma, that cuts through the discrimination, that does use the best of empathy, but it's not just empathy. It is structured so a person can better know how to take care of themselves and take better care of their community because it's not just an individual issue here. It's not just about the individual saying, oh, well, I'm gonna inject uh, and I better use a, a clean syringe, but it's also taking care of co queer community. And that's what we see. Folks taking care of each other saying, I brought extra syringe exchange, uh, syringes because I just got them from the exchange. Um, I will give them to you if you go get it next time, right? So, so they're protecting each other. And that's how we stop HIV. That's how we stop Hep C, you know? Oh, and that's how we give that. That's how you stop overdoses because you get extra kits because people know they're overdosing to your left and to your right when a very powerful um, batch comes out, right? And 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 it's and that's what lived experience means: being prepared because I know what happens. We know what happens, and I need to take care of my brother, my sister, my cousin, my uncle, my best friend, uh, my partner, right? So so it's it's about that, and that's how entrenched we are in in those communities as SSPs. Yeah, that was very beautiful responses. Thank you. Phoebe, do you want to add anything? Yeah, in, in you know, in our area, um, anonymity is so critical for our program to work because there's just a, a lot of stigma um, and discrimination directed towards people who, especially people who inject drugs. And, you know, people who use drugs anyway, even though we have a bar on every corner, right? There's, there's just a very, there's, there's this cultural dynamic that exists. People who use drugs are the worst people in our community, hands down. You know, according to these um, sort of the, this, this social attitudes that, that are really prevailing. So we, it took a very long time for our program to establish the trust of people in our community. Um, we, we did a lot of things that didn't work in terms of communication. And, and really what worked was to, um, you know, we're, we're from the community. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm from Bad River and, and my, the co-founder of our organization is also from our community. Um, and we would have, um, we, we would, establish a trusting relationship with, with somebody who used drugs. And it was just like a one-to-one -one thing at first. And then, and then we would, you know, establish a rapport and a relationship and, and they would um, start 
using, you know, the, the supplies that we provided. And then they would tell other people. Um, but all of our interactions with folks are guided by this, by consent. And, and we're, we don't, you know, like they'll tell us, I don't, you can't come at this time because this, like my neighbor will see you or something like that. And so you need to do this in a particular way. And then listening to them do, you know, like following their instructions to the T has been really important. And, and, you know, like when somebody first, when somebody first gets on the line and starts talking to us, explaining how it's, it's anonymous and how that it's, it's, you know, based on your consent and we can figure out things together where we're going to meet or whatever. And, um, and not being pushy about my agenda, you know, like, like the, the, the reason for us getting together is to fulfill their agenda, you know, and it has to be like safe and everything, but we've never really had a problem with safety. So, um, you know, I don't, it would not work at all. Like none of, we would not have any success whatsoever unless it's really um, directed by the participants that we work for. Um, and so, I mean, I feel like we, we recently published a, a report um, and, and it, it was a, it was a, it was a research project that we did to interview um, a, a couple of folks from our program, about 20, 20 of our participants. Um, and, you know, we worked on protocols to do this in a really respectful manner and to compensate them for their, for their input and their data that they were going to provide. But what we, what we found from that research study is that um, they, they, uh, they appreciate that approach, you know, and, and it's really important to get that, get that feedback from them and then incorporate that, continually be incorporating the feedback that we receive from the participants into the way we operate. Um, there was also a question about sort of the organization and, you know, the hierarchy in the organization. Um, you know, we're Ojibwe, and so in our community, the you know the 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 leadership model with a leader directing somebody and everybody else following them is very foreign to us. Like that's not how we operate, and so you know we we operate with um, kind of a collective, and we make decisions on a collective basis, and we empower people's leadership. You know, like if somebody somebody wants to go and, and really work on overdose prevention services, we will support them and help them and, and do stuff like that, you know. But it's it's not um it's not necessarily about like this top down kind of colonial structure. It's it's really about um, you know, working on working on our strengths and 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 building up like our our goals, you know, like our, our goals for serving our community. Absolutely. Um, so I want to I want to kind of pivot the conversation a little bit. I think um, there's there's so much amazing stuff here, and I wish we had a lot more time. Um, but I want to to kind of talk about um, funding the work that y'all are doing. So kind of pivot to a funding conversation. So I know you've all kind of shared with us many of the different types of programs that your organizations offer, um, from the actual exchange to patient navigation, to connecting to medication for opioid use disorder, housing and homeless uh, services, food pantries, um, soup kitchens out of your garage, like all these amazing programs, right? Um, and so, we're, we're seeing that there is some momentum right now around federal and state dollars to support comprehensive syringe services. So we see that there are new funding streams opening up um, from different federal agencies to support these programs or some components of the programs. Um, you know, I think all of y'all's organizations, if I'm if I'm not mistaken, um, have both private and public funding. So um, in your opinion, do you need both? And, and what are the benefits of, of each of those types of funding streams? Well, in Connecticut, uh, we are lucky to be one of the few states that have a state funded uh, 
syringe access programs. So while we are the only harm reduction organization by mission, vision, and value, we are part of a, a network of syringe service providers. I believe there's now we're uh, including those that we support. Uh, we support six different programs from ours. Uh, but we also have benefited again from private funding, which is allowed, which is put us in, in place, like Rafi was saying, as a result of the foundation money that we received, we were able to use those funds to uh, support our work, which put us in a place to, to receive funding from other uh, state entities. But I, I guess what what is the is there a necessity for both by all means because as we received those monies they also became those funding streams are more formalized and we don't have the ability or the freedom to do what we do well and that's take a little and make a lot you know so i you know i can do so much more with 40,000 unrestricted dollars than i can with 150 uh, line item dollars and, and the, the return on that investment, you know, with what we get for our budget, we, you know, and, and still keep in mind, pay our people more than what some of the other organizations pay theirs. So we're not trying to exploit, you know, and where we can. So it, but that couldn't get done, you know, if we didn't have that flexibility to, to use funds where, you know, where necessary. Um, you know, to, to, you know, I mean, even before our sandwiches, you know, when, you know, both uh, Age United said, hey, you know what, we know things are chaotic this year. So, you know, there's some more freedom and you using these money, uh, you know, for us to add, you know, use a portion of that to add to our second minivan, which then led to, you know, uh, of now what we have is a fleet of on-demand, you know, service. People can flag, flag the vans down in the street. Uh, you know, the different things we were able to do, like to do some of the PPE kits early on, you know, and, and, and the printed media to go along with them. Even for, you know, the, I, I'm, I'm one for, for printed documents. If I had to wait to print this with state dollars, we might see it next year. You know what I'm saying? It, it's got to go through three people and five other desks where I was able to go on, you know, and, and get, get those printed. And so there are so many things that we're able to do that we wouldn't do with those, 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 those funds, you know? I mean, that's in, in short, I hope I was able to answer some of it. Yeah, Mark, th thank you for that, because it, it, it's, it's spot on. I mean, for us, we need both at this point. Um, the, 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 the request for services, I mean, right now, there, there's no way we, we, we can respond to all of it, one. So the more funds we get, the, the, the more we could respond, or the more sister organizations can pop up so we can become more of a community here in Puerto Rico, right? So, so um, there, there's that. And then there is the, with state dollars, which is, they ask us for so much paperwork. They only fund 22% of our syringe exchange program. And they, in, in many ways, they feel like they own 150% of it, right? But, it, but it's only, right, that, 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 that's the game at, at this level, right? For HIV prevention, to make sure HIV rates don't skyrocket and to respond to the overdose, it, it, that, that's, that's the name of the game. So syringe exchange programs by the DOH are funded by 22%. And, and we're at the top of the ground and they're saying, I can't give you more. And they question amounts of syringes, stuff like, like, wait, we should talk about science here, right? 
Um, but if we didn't have the, the, the private funding, there is no way we could pivot and actually do service delivery. I mean, there's no way we could do it without um, uh, private funding. So at this point, we've built organizations that need to have both. And if right now I have a state which is actually pulling back from syringe exchange programs, which is actually pulling back because we're, 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 we're literally, Puerto Rico has filed from bankruptcy, uh, austerity measures, and they're gonna cut in HIV prevention, right? Um, and that, that's just a sad truth. So we, we just try to, to maintain with other private funders and balance that. Um, so we definitely need both. And I mean, we, we encourage funders that are not in this line to get educated in this line. For example, we, we had a funder that came to us and loved the, the overdose prevention and they wanted to do more overdose prevention. We said, let's meet. No, we want to fund this. It's like, no, you need to see what we do, which is so much more than overdose prevention. You need to see this. Really, and then they fell in love with it. going like, oh, I didn't know this was at this level. And that's, that's what we're also into. Like, no, you need to, to fund everything. It's not just this little thing that you want to fund. You, you should see the entire package and see why it's important to, to understand uh, harm reduction as a concept and as all these roots that are created in communities that can provide, that provide life-saving services, which is really what we do. Phoebe, do you have anything? We, you're good. Okay. Um, <laughs> yeah, this has been this has been so fantastic. I I really hate that we are at time with this panel. I want to say thank you so much, Phoebe, Rafi, Mark. Thank you for for taking time out of running your organizations to share your knowledge with us. Um, we really really appreciate it. Um, we're gonna bring y'all back in uh, about forty minutes for the Q and A session. Um, and so now we will transition to supporting change. A conversation with national leaders. And as those, uh, as our new panelists uh, bring their videos on, I want to just remind folks that you can submit questions through the Q&A box at any time. Uh, my colleague Kelly is monitoring the Q&A. She's also monitoring the chat, um, collecting your questions, and we'll be putting all of these to our panelists uh, during the Q&A session, which will start in about 40 minutes. Um, so we're now turning to our next panel, Supporting Change, a Conversation <laughs> with National Leaders. Um, and uh, I want to say welcome to everyone. I'm so excited to have this, uh, these panelists with us today and to have this conversation. Um, and I want to kick things off with a round of introductions. Uh, and we're going to kick things off with you, Anne. Thank you so much, Zach. And thank you for including, including me and the Elton John AIDS Foundation in this. It's really when you listen to Mark and Rafi and Phoebe talk about their work, it's, it's just absolutely humbling and extraordinary to hear. Um, I'll do a very quick uh, canter through some of the background on the Elton John AIDS Foundation. And as I'm sure many of you know, we're, we're 19 years old. We're one of the leading AIDS organizations in the world. And our mission is really simple. We want to be a powerful force um, in the end of the AIDS epidemic, and we're committed to no more discrimination, no more infections, and no more AIDS deaths, no matter where you are or who you are. Um, I want to just broaden it a little bit because obviously we've heard a lot about the US epidemic, and this is what we're here to discuss today, but I think sometimes it's useful to understand a sense of solidarity that this is a problem that's affecting people all around the world and and we and the commonalities are much much stronger than the differences so i just i just want to touch on that we 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 don't try and and replicate the work of wonderful organizations like the ones we've just heard from we're a grant making organization we work with local partners and we try and amplify what they do using elton's voice and our leverage and 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 our, our expertise at inter -level, international levels to change policy so Via our grant making, we fund organizations across the world to implement new and more accessible ways for people to at risk to get tested for HIV and access comprehensive services. And this of course includes provision of low threshold and community led harm reduction services. We wanna reduce barriers that increase and, and increase opportunities for people uh, to make sure that they have high quality HIV prevention, treatment and care. And that includes people who use drugs and people who are vulnerable, who are extremely vulnerable. And we wanna raise public awareness and support uh, an engagement for key populations, um, including of course, people who use drugs. And to do this, we fund in four continents, um, including some of the most challenging environments in the world. 
uh, and with some of the most vulnerable people in the world. So we work in Eastern Europe and Central Asia, where between 2018, 2010 and 2018, um, the HIV infection rate has risen by 70%. We support programs for young people in Sub-Saharan Africa, where just under a third of people who inject drugs are estimated to be living with HIV. And um, we currently support a number of programs in Asia and the Pacific, where 13% of all new HIV infections are amongst people who inject drugs. So uh, here in the US, um, we support targeted work via the Free Initiative with AIDS United, which is um, specifically aiming to provide support and, and um, services to transgender and um, uh, non-gender conforming people, uh, black men who identify as gay, bisexual, queer uh, and transgender. And um, we've been a long-term partner, obviously, of the Syringe Access Fund, which is why we're here today. Um, so we work in really a, a wide variety of places, but, but as I say, the commonalities are much stronger than the differences from Russia, Ukraine, Myanmar, India, Vietnam, Indonesia, and the US. You hear the same heartbreaking stories as we've just been hearing from, from um, the panel beforehand over and over again. Um, why, why did we begin supporting the Syringe Access Fund? Um, since we began 19 years ago, the foundation's been providing support for people who use drugs all around the world. And in the US, we've been, a, as, as you mentioned earlier, we've been a key funder of the uh, Syringe Access Fund since the mid 2000s. Um, I think, I think the critical thing, and this, this is the same with our work with the LGBTQ community, is this notion that unless you, unless you really understand and support and champion and amplify the voices of the people who are most vulnerable in society, you really aren't addressing the problem at all. And so um, people who use drugs were always a core uh, a beneficiary group for us. It's always um, an area where we've wanted to support. And it continues to be uh, a, big, a big priority for the foundation. Um, we, we support comprehensive harm reduction programs. Um, and you, know, I, you will know better than I do about the various legislation that's allowed for provision of some services, but not about, not about syringes and so on. Um, and you, I think you shared, Zach, earlier some, some scary statistics um, about the HIV infections in the US. So I won't, I won't repeat those, but harm reduction services, including needle exchange and syringe programs are so proven and cost-effective. And if we can get past, you know, what strikes me over and over again, hearing, hearing um, people who work in this field talk about this is, this overwhelming sense of blame and judgment and, and that this is the massive barrier that stops us from being able to, which creates the laws in the first place and then stops us being able to really amplify the services that are gonna save people's lives. So it's, it's, it, it, it remains a, a really big priority for us. Uh, in the US, SSPs are a key component, obviously under the ending the HIV epidemic, uh, policy and it's something that we want to champion um, and it means that syringe access whether in terms of, of service provision or advocacy um, to achieve better laws is going to remain a core part of the foundation's efforts going forward um, and I would say that we you know we would be very keen we've been long-term supporters of the syringe access fund we would be very keen to find broader common cause with any other entities or funders who really care about this issue. Because one of the things that, that makes certain populations so vulnerable is this bifurcating of people and putting people into different pockets. Actually, what we're talking about is fellow human beings and their vulnerabilities and the ways in which we can mitigate that. And so, you know, the, the, um, the issue, the, the crossroads between people who use drugs and HIV is particularly acute and, ex and extraordinarily needy, but there is a broader community of people who care passionately about um, mitigating the impact of, of, of risk for people who use drugs. And we really welcome the opportunity to bring them into this fight more generally. Um, so I'm gonna stop there because I know that there are lots of wonderful contributions from fellow panelists.
Thank you so much, Anne. Uh, we are so grateful to have you here today, and we're so thankful for Elton John AIDS Foundation's support in this area in the United States. So thank you. Um, Daniel, would you like to introduce yourself? Great. Well, first, hats off to AIDS United for setting this table and just echoing Anne's words. Um, it's always so relaxing and reassuring to hear your words, Anne. But as you, I think as you said, Phoebe, Rafi, and Mark, you're the heroes of this, of this work and this panel. We have this vaunted title, National Leaders. We salute you. Um, I, from the Levi Strauss um, experience, you know, I, I come from a corporate foundation uh, for a company that's 168 years old. And I think we take that long legacy as permission to, to get in early on the issues that we care about and stay the course. And the long game is really important because so many corporate foundations in the name of this gospel of innovation are privileging the, the new and disruptive over the tried and true. And that's criminal. Um, we've stayed in three lanes as a foundation, the fight against HIV and AIDS, worker rights and well-being in the apparel industry and social justice. Um, and uh, we actually have been the, the, we actually were the first corporate foundation um, to, in, to emerge in the fight against HIV and AIDS and the first company to emerge in the fight against this pandemic. Uh, it dates back to 1982 when it emerged as an employee issue. The first donation came a year later. And it's been, been really, we've been really proud to stay the course for, I can't do the math, about 38, 39 years now. Um, and that, that amount, um, it's, it's dwarfed by what Elton John gives, for example, um, 76 million in that period. But we really believe that being a, a constant gardener to the grassroots matters so much. And we'll say more about that in a second. Uh, we believe that there's a case to be made. Um, one of our values is courage as a, as, a, as, a, as a company, as well as empathy. And there are moments that being the, the taking the difficult but right decision and being first um, and standing in the face of controversy um, is a way of creating impact. And that included you know, um, desegregating factories in the American South um, long before it was legally mandated. Um, we, very unpopular decision to deny uh, matching gifts to the Boy Scouts of America in 1992 for their homophobic policies. And that, that resulted in 100, 130,000 hate letters. Um, but we stood the ground. Um, the policy shifted about 30 years later. Um, so we made a very calculated decision when emerging in 2004 to be the first corporate foundation to address uh, syringe access. And we, we studied it very carefully and I think, you know, to be really, I want to be instructive to other funders, really, that, that we chose truth, evidence, and facts. And we played broken record with pretty much one sentence, that syringe access and, and, and syringe exchange are the only proven methods to lower HIV transmission and hep C among people who use drugs. Um, we, we saw that there are about six government-funded studies out there that showed that needle exchange programs work vis-a-vis work -vis HIV and AIDS without increasing rates of drug use, drug injection, or crime. We didn't go there. We could have given a more complicated harm reduction strategy. We also believe that nobody should be left behind. Um, so, you know, but as for threats to either our foundation or our company, um, some were expected, but very few were manifested. We actually got a lot more positive uh, feedback around this. Um, and, uh, and, and um, you know, that was, uh, that was terrific. Um, and um, we, I just, in the, in the time that I, that, 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 that uh, I think that, that we have here, um, we really see this as a social justice issue. One, uplifting the voices of those who, who bear the brunt um, and we have a perfect storm and that was very, very much, very well laid out. Um, and secondly, this idea of unjust and outdated laws being um, lifted, they are, these are institutional forms of stigma and discrimination. And the fact that uh, that the syringe access fund funds both services and advocacy. It's a winning combination. Um, and for, I think for both um, AIDS United and the syringe access fund, it's based on this premise that when funders collaborate, join forces and bring their asset, assets and perspectives together, more is, um, uh, more can be gained there. And our work is built on the principle of leverage because private funders only account for about two to 3% of the overall philanthropic response. So private philanthropy as, is at its best when we're taking risks, getting in early, showing the proof of concept, supporting ideas and organizations when other sectors aren't willing. And I, the other thing is that this idea that nobody uh, being left behind in, in the HIV or whatever response 
and and I've worked in the human rights field for over 40 for 30 over 30 years and I think more than any other group people who, who use drugs are seen by governments institutions communities and families as not worthy of rights uh, but the proof is, is resounding so I wanted to give like a little bit of Sally Struthers this it's a very dated re reference some of you will know who I'm talking about the syringe access fund is the best example, I, I would argue, in the HIV field of a pooled fund. And really proud to stand beside the funders. But along the 15 year history, we've had to do a lot of substitution therapy of ourselves. Um, and every funder has a cycle. And we, we honor so many funders that have given so much to the fund, like the Irene Diamond Fund. But let me just amplify one thing. This last round, of 675,000 is about one third the historical 10 year average of, of, of this fund at a time of Rona, recession, housing crisis and overdose crisis. My, I'm on my soapbox here. And to say that if you have $25,000, if you have $500,000, 5 million, one targeted grant to these awesome folks at AIDS United, they will figure out where it needs to go, um, please. If there's one thing that comes out of, of, of this, more funders giving, this is the place to go. So I'll stop there. Thanks. Thank you, Daniel. Those are um, such kind words, and I really appreciate that. Um, I love the Levi Strauss Foundation. I love the story of the foundation. Um, I'm wearing Levi's right now because, I mean, y'all are just such a great example of a corporate foundation and, and, and just what philanthropy could and should be. Um, and so I so appreciate you being here and I so appreciate y'all's support over the years. Thank you. Um, now we're going to move over to Jonathan for uh, in your introduction. Okay, well, thank you, Zach and, and Jesse. Um, I, I also wanted to say how, how uh, I moved and, and excited I am from the discussion from the first panel on this one. And I, I, uh, I certainly am going to think about using courage as a core value for, for my center at CDC now. Um, it, it, it really does reflect so much of what people are doing. And um, you know, Zach asked me to, to kind of cover a few areas um, from kind of the scientific and CDC perspective. Um, I wanted to start by acknowledging that the past year has been extremely difficult as we've confronted both you know, COVID-19, we continue to fight for health equity, inclusion, and uh, racial justice. And just as HIV did, this new pandemic of COVID has amplified long-standing social inequities that put many people of color um, and people who use drugs at increased risk of getting uh, COVID-19. The same inequities that increased the likelihood of getting HIV and that led to the health disparities that we know about for so many uh, decades. So as we continue to do better with COVID-19, I am reminded of how we first responded to AIDS, including the organizations that the two, uh, my two fellow panelists had. Uh, we did not wait for highly effective ART. It took years for that. And we didn't wait for PrEP. It was uh, approved by the FDA 30 years after the epidemic began. But we took immediate action to support each other. And we, in, we ensured that research was conducted with community members and scientists working alongside each other. And we influenced what research programs and policies were prioritized by governments and the private sector. And the current topic, syringe service programs, really does exemplify that tradition. Um, so I work at CDC, I oversee um, divisions that um, manage HIV, viral hepatitis, STDs, and TB, very stigmatized um, diseases. And, um, and the population um, uh, that we work with are often forgotten by others. Uh, so just a few days ago, Stacey Abrams and Lauren Growargo published an article in the New York Times titled, It May Take 10 Years, Do It Anyway. And they had a goal uh, to change the political framework of Georgia, and they described several necessary actions, including play the long game. And I think to succeed in public health, we have to do that too. So I'd like to tell a bit of a condensed version of the story of CDC and SSPs. And why we're beginning to see the fruit of a collective long-term plan, but we're still in the midst of change. And as Daniel emphasized, to succeed, we need extra support and more players on our team. So people who inject drugs experience many health risks, including HIV, viral hepatitis, heart infections, overdose, and the violence and poverty so often caused by the social and economic determinants that surround drug use. 
In the 1980s, at the beginning of the HIV epidemic, about a third of all HIV infections occurred among persons who injected drugs. And the majority of those were from sharing needles that had been previously used by someone else. So in 1983, John Stuen Parker and other Yale medical students, not so far away from our, our colleague from Hartford, began distributing sterile needles to people who use drugs in New Haven uh, to prevent HIV infection. And by 2007, there were almost 200 needle exchange programs in the country. And they were established by many of the people on the call today uh, through pragmatism and social justice. And they were founded on the idea that providing sterile needles and syringes and other services to people to prevent HIV infection was good. And since then, SSPs have become the quintessential example of harm reduction. That concept was and is both successful and controversial. Controversial because HIV and drug use are stigmatized as so many of you emphasized earlier. It's often seen as a moral failing and there is concern that certain service programs implicitly condone and enable drug use. However, the facts tell a different story. SSPs have substantial benefits for clients in the community. A large study showed that in 103 cities worldwide, HIV infection declined by 19% in cities with SSPs and increased 8% in others. A meta-analysis showed that syringe service programs better when they're linked to medication-assisted substance use treatment. SSPs do not increase illegal drug use. And these programs are cost-saving to the healthcare system and society, just as Zach emphasized earlier. In addition, clients who participate in SSPs are three times more likely to stop using drugs than those who don't. Naloxone distribution through SSPs has been shown to save lives and syringe service programs protect the public by facilitating the safety. And there, there was a consistent decrease in HIV infections among people who injected drugs since the 1990s. And in the last 15 years, there was a 63% decrease in new injection drug use associated HIV, the largest decrease among any risk group. However, this decline has leveled off since 2011 and actually increased by 4% in 2015 for the first time in two decades. And this national increase in IDU associated HIV cases in 2015 can largely be attributed to one single outbreak where the opioid epidemic, HIV and viral hepatitis epidemics ignited in a rural Indiana community, the one that Zach highlighted in his talk. So since then, the proportion and the absolute number of HIV infections among people who use drugs have started to increase. And we have seen multiple large outbreaks of HIV and hepatitis C throughout the nation. So at CDC, we've, we've always financially supported HIV prevention among people who use drugs through grants to health departments and community-based organizations. And we want to do our part in a holistic response to support people, even if we see through the lens of public health. However, since 1988, federal funds could not be used to support SSPs, except for a two-year gap, until 2015, despite conclusions by CDC, the National Academies of Medicine, and the Surgeon General of documented benefits of SSPs. So at CDC, we have an obligation to monitor the HIV epidemic and to share that information with the public and policymakers. And we support effective programs and we conduct practical research. Beginning several years ago, we had a new goal to normalize syringe services programs as a core component of public health. What I believe Doug Wirth was highlighting in his question in the chat, just as the American public can expect that their community would have a TB clinic, an STI clinic and a community health center, we want the expectation that there will also be an SSP. An SSP that ideally not only provides sterile injection equipment, but also screens for infectious diseases, links interested clients to substance use treatment, distributes naloxone, provides basic wound care, vaccinations, and all the social services that people who use drugs can benefit from, just as what was described in the last session. So we conducted reviews of the evidence, published fact sheets on our website, and developed a technical package regarding syringe service programs. We investigate outbreaks and produce guidelines on how to respond to them effectively. We met with legislators and health departments and shared information when they were interested in learning more about SSPs. We worked with Dr. Jerome Adams, the Surgeon General, who I knew was already supportive of SSPs from when we had met in Indiana when he was Commissioner of Health. We worked with others at HHS who all became vocal supporters of the effectiveness 
of SSPs. And we financially supported organizations that had experience running syringe service programs so that they can assist others to do the same. We analyzed county level data and produced a vulnerability index that highlighted the counties in the nation most at risk for outbreaks associated with drug use. And we shared this information on the web and with state and local governments and communities. And currently 44 state health departments have received what's called a determination of need that allow them to use federal funds to support syringe service programs. The path towards the nation fully embracing harm reduction is still a long one. SSPs are topics of controversy every few months, and there's still a prohibition of using federal funds for the purchase of injection equipment, which often makes up a large proportion of the expenses for an individual SSP. That means we need philanthropy, just as we have always needed community leadership. At the same time today, I believe that we've never been closer to a widespread acceptance of harm reduction. As a result of the opioid epidemic, many more people have been personally affected by drug overdose. More people see the complex factors that society puts in the way of the lives of people who use drugs. And more people are understanding the benefits to everyone of using SSPs as a way to reach people who use drugs where they are with services that help them and benefit society. So we turn the corner on the HIV epidemic with strong community leadership, highly effective tools like ART and PrEP and innovative approaches to public health. And I, and I did want to take a moment to thank AIDS United, my fellow panelists and all of you participating in the meeting because you've been the foundation of much of that. In many ways, we are in the best and worst of times. The good news is that sustained investment in HIV have yielded major successes. We've decreased incidence, we've increased survival and we've decreased some disparities. However, the situation is not improving for people who use drugs. The HIV, viral hepatitis and overdose deaths that we are seeing throughout the nation are not inevitable. SSPs alone will not solve our problems, but they are a spoke in the wheel of success. And without them, we will not succeed. It is a part of what I think of as our large community's long-term plan. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jonathan. Uh, it is such a pleasure to have you here uh, and have the CDC's voice in this conversation. Um, and I just wanna say how amazing it is to be able to go to the CDC's website and pull the SSP fact sheets. Um, I've been in conversations with policymakers in DC at our like annual AIDS Watch event, doing advocacy for certain services programs and then say, well, what does the CDC say? CDC say? And I can pull out my phone. I can say, well, actually they say this. Um, and to have y'all support means so much. So we really thank you for that. Um, <clears throat> all right, Jesse, you're up next. Thank, thank you, Zach. You've done a magnificent job today, and we so appreciate your leadership for the Syringe Access Fund. And thank you to our fe fellow panelists, especially uh, those who are uh, leaders, uh, not just for your grassroots organizations, but for your national and global organizations. This has been an amazing opportunity. And I want to share with you not just the organizational commitment of Age United to syringe services, but also the personal commitment that I've had for now over 20 years. Many of you know me for a long time, and you know that I was AIDS director in Philadelphia in the 1990s. And when I started that job, I learned that we were supporting one of the only needle exchange programs in the United States, known as Prevention Point in Philadelphia. And it was an actual wonderful leader in the, in the movement, but I was shocked and I do mean shocked to learn that I could not support that organization with federal money or with state money. And I could only use a very small pool of dollars that was allocated from our city council. And it's still a shock to me today that there are so many states where federal funds cannot be used and so many, uh, and still as Jonathan just told us, federal funds cannot be used to purchase the equipment needed to actually create the kind of programs that are needed to prevent new infections for the, for the substance abuse community. And so my commitment and our organizational commitment are very much aligned. As you heard earlier, Age United is committed to ending the HIV epidemic. And we're also committed to harm reduction through the work that we're doing. And when we think about harm reduction, we can't just think about PrEP. We can't just think about U equal U. We do have to think about syringe access because all of those, all of those harm reduction efforts 
promote personal health and wellness, but they also promote personal dignity and personal efficacy. And those are important for ending this epidemic as well. And I believe we can't end this epidemic if we leave anyone behind. And we've heard repeatedly today that at least 10% of new HIV infections occur in the substance abuse community. We cannot leave them behind. And as Anne said so eloquently, the stigma that continues is part of our problem. But our solution for ending the epidemic does have to be a syndemic approach, addressing the HIV epidemic, the STI epidemic, the hepatitis, and the opioid epidemic. And that means we have to address the structural barriers that prevent us from ending the epidemic in any one of those fields. And those structural barriers continue to be policies and laws and funding. And without the necessary policies and laws and funding to support syringe access, we will continue to leave people behind. I so appreciate what our friend Daniel said that both services and advocacy are needed. And that is precisely what the syringe access fund has done. It support, supports both services and advocacy. And the federal advocacy is needed now more than ever because we have an opportunity if we use our resources correctly and our voices correctly to help Congress end the ban on using federal funds for purchasing of syringes or cookers or any of the other devices that are necessary to help people obtain uh, good injections and safe injections and safe structures for their work and, their, and for achieving their goal of having a healthy life. But the Syringe Access Fund, which was created some 17 years ago, has done so much that I think we need to share with you that it's not only given away over $17 million over its 17 years, those $17 million have helped purchase a third of all the clean needles that have been exchanged in the United States. So when we think about those wonderful uh, health outcomes and all those dollars and lives saved, a third of them have been because of the syringe access fund. And so I wanna make sure to thank our partners, the Ellen John AIDS Foundation, the Levi Strauss Foundation, the Henry Van Ameringen Foundation, and the, and the Comer Foundation for its continued partnership. You know, when I sign these grantee letters, and, and Zach sends them to me on a regular basis, I see 60, 70, 75 grantees who are receiving five or 10 or 15 or $20,000. And as we've heard from the earlier panel, those funds go a long way to provide services and to save lives. And the kind of services that we've heard today about connecting people to linkages to care, to their ongoing health and wellness, including whether for pregnancy or for uh, STI treatments, all of those promote our broader public health. And so I'm very proud, but I'm also very concerned as Jonathan has told us, we have many problems because of COVID-19. And perhaps one of the biggest one is that syringe services are not considered essential services. That's yet another barrier and another reason why we need to do our work to help make services possible at the grassroots level, level where lives can be saved. So our commitment is firm. We will continue doing this work and Zach, I'd like to make a small announcement. Because this work is so important, Age United is putting up a matching fund of $100,000. And if we are able to bring in a new $100,000, Age United will put up $100,000 to help kickstart our work to make sure that the syringe access fund is sustainable 
in 2021. Thank you, Jesse. That is a fantastic announcement. Um, it is so wonderful that um, to have you as our leader at Age United and to have you uh, prioritize harm reduction in the way that you do. Um, thank you. Thank you a lot. It, it means so much to have a CEO um, that, that prioritizes this work and puts it um, at the top of the list. So thank you. Um, and with that, we will round out our, and I'm realizing our introductions have taken most of the panel, but I think everyone has had such fantastic things to say that you've actually answered a lot of the questions that I had outlined. So we'll hand things over to Mary and then maybe try to squeeze in one question before Q&A. Great. Thank you, Zach. And um, Jesse, that's amazing news. I'm very excited and um, we could use all the dollars that we could get. Um, a huge thank you to AIDS United. You know, um, Zach and I work hand in hand. We're a private family foundation. I work for Comer Family Foundation. Um, we made the decision to actually stay outside of the fund. And so this is another different way to think about how you can enter the funding field. Um, mostly because we've been doing um, funding of syringe access since uh, the 90s. So we've been doing this for a very long time and it's really exciting work. So. Um, Again, we're Comer Family Foundation. We're a small private family foundation in Chicago. Mm -hmm. And um, we're rooted in seeding ideas in innovative, um, innovative programs. And so when we think about syringe access, um, you know, we actually do have four main areas of giving and it's not just syringe access, um, which neatly falls into our equitable healthcare portfolio, but we also fund education for first-generation college-bound youth abrupt climate change and culture. So, um, you know, when you think about it, we're, we're fairly all over the place, but yet very uniquely positioned to make very meaningful impact. Um, you know, it was something that was mentioned earlier, like these small grants to just start programs alone and give the autonomy and flexibility to individuals is, is um, remarkable. So as I mentioned, we came into the space because back in the early 80s, there was no public health response for people who use drugs. At that time, it was the high, second highest transmission category for HIV. Um, and at the time, there were less than 25 harm reduction programs in the United States. And um, our founder, Stephanie Comer, um, worked to get together to get some of the top programs together. And they had a meeting, and it was the harm reduction working group. Um, Fast forward to today, it's now known as the National Harm Reduction Coalition. So, you know, we've been in this since the early 90s, and um, we've given over $15.5 million in syringe access, which translates to over 770 grants. Um, we talked a lot about return on investment, but, you know, we're conservatively saying it's $108 million. And that's only if you just talk about the impact of treatment of HIV. That is not factoring in treatment of hepatitis C hospitalizations for overdose, wound care, endocarditis, and so much more. But, you know, as you've heard multiple times, syringes are banned from federal funding. So where our sweet spot is, is we like to fund and prioritize where the government can't or won't fund. So um, naturally, um, because of that, we do fund, 90% of our funding does go into sterile syringes, safer smoking and safer snorting kits. We believe in trust-based philanthropy. So even though I say that most of our money goes to syringes and transportation and all the things that Rafi had mentioned earlier, um, we believe in general operating gifts. And so, um, and, and the importance of that is truly because of the ability for private dollars to be flexible and be available for rapid response funds as needed. Um, there's been some cool innovation that we've seen with our dollars like mail order or even types of um, um, overdose prevention sites feasibility, right? Things that we can fund that others can't. And um, one thing that's really important to note, you know, we've been doing this for almost 30 years now and the sky hasn't fallen, right? With our low threshold funding. So we've been, if anything, saving lives. And as Dan Big would say, unapologetic, unapologetically saving lives. So, um, it's important to know that we will listen to the community with lived experience. And quite frankly, I use that as marching orders on how I prioritize our funding at Comer Family Foundation. We have a deep focus in seed funding and building infrastructure. So if and when we get the federal funding, we're ready, right? Um, 
But I want to just pause before I kind of close and give it back to Zach. I, I really want to underscore, you know, we've all been talking about funding, funding, funding. We've needed the funding this whole time, way before COVID. And you have heard loud and clear and we've navigated it, but just, I wanna be clear that the programs that we have been funding, we need to listen to what they're saying, right? This is a canary in the coal mine of what has happened in the last year. The number of programs of what they need and they can't, they can't even keep up with the demand. Even if it was a well-funded program, they can't keep up with the demand. Zach and I are still seeing applications from some of the top funded states across the United States. Um, before COVID, we thought that an effective program budget would be about $200,000. To give context, our average grantee is a $100,000 operating program. Um, we need to fund them like we want them to succeed. In COVID, the urgency, we're again, witnessing increase in participants, increase in demand, decrease in funding, mostly because our states are struggling to figure out how they can figure out where the funding is gonna go to keep up with COVID. Um, and finally, I just wanna make sure that we're addressing the fact that when I was talking about the canary in the coal mine, I'm talking about the sheer volume of increases. 2020, just to underscore, is an 18% increase of overdose over 2019. And that's just preliminary data in the first three months. It's personal, right? Phoebe had mentioned she just lost someone. I have two personal friends. This is people that we know and it's in our community. And finally, in Illinois alone, a striking racial disparity. We're seeing a sheer um, volume of increase of ER visits of five times high, five point five times more for African American populations for overdose than we are in our white and non Hispanic populations. So, I just want to underscore, and Zach, thanks for the extra couple minutes that we need to listen to the programs, and we have been um, at Comer. I just have the deepest respect for how incredibly adaptive and reliable they have been through the pandemic. And we're, we're just so proud of them. And um, thank you for just everyone on the call for being such a remain, like being committed to finding opportunities that we can assist them to stay as essential healthcare providers. So thanks. Thank you so much, Mary. And um, I mean, we so appreciate our partnership with the Comer Family Foundation. I so appreciate you as a colleague and a friend. Um, so thank you so much. I want to um, invite our other panelists to uh, to turn those cameras back on and rejoin us. And, and while they're doing that, I want to ask um, the, uh, the current panel, um, you know, one of the things that we wanted to be able to share with folks today is if you're from a foundation, if you're from, if you are a funder and you're joining us today, what are easy ways for you to get involved in giving to syringe services programs and in the harm reduction community? And so I'm curious to hear from our, our funder panel or the leadership panel with funders on it. Uh, what do you recommend to folks that are listening today? Jesse, I saw you unmuted, so I'll, I'll toss it to you first. I think one of the most important things that funders can do is to break down their very own internal stigma about harm reduction. Uh, I think Anne said that so beautifully. Uh, we, after 40 years of this epidemic, I think that is one of the stigmas that is not spoken about. But we keep hearing about the opioid epidemic, but connecting the opioid epidemic to HIV may very well be what funders can start to do. And when they start making that connection, it will lead you to the services of SSPs. And I think that uh, we can help as uh, advocates to tell that story. And I think this webinar is doing that, but funders who are concerned about that opioid epidemic, the the connection is there and it leads directly to SSPs and the ones in your community that are being underfunded. Anyone else want to jump in on this one? Daniel? Jesse, oh. Go ahead, Mary. I was going to say, um, I, I think Jesse did a really phenomenal job. And, and Daniel, you had mentioned, um, mentioned this earlier. It's, um, you know, the, the, the harm reduction programs are just so much more than syringes, right? And I think we need to get over that as, as a community. And, um, you know, there's a litany of ways that you can introduce harm reduction and syringe service programming into your portfolio. And I, I welcome the opportunity to speak to you and to your board 
Um, but I think the, the easiest way to do it is, um, and, and I'll, I'll make a pitch for the syringe access fund, um, is to give money to the syringe access fund, right? Like you can learn through that program because they have peer review, they help, um, they help get the money in the community for you. And that's like a, a first level of entry to get into it. The second level of entry to get into it would be doing direct grant making like we do at Comer. And I am more than happy to share um, all of our templates. In fact, we do everything as much as possible in alignment with AIDS United to create lower threshold and barrier for the grantees in the community just to make it easy on them. Let me, let me say briefly that um, for foundations that work on social issues, a connection to a syringe service program, it's much closer than you think. Um, it's so radically intersectional, I think, that there's, there's so many entry points. We started with a local partner, the San Francisco AIDS Foundation. Um, and you know, before the Syringe Access Fund funded their work, um, our staff every five years or so um, does a volunteer day um, with them. And we've, we've taken our board on site visits. It takes time to inform and educate people, the, you know, the decision makers, people in management and company, our board members who are family members who own Levi's, but one or two key voices goes a long way um, and, and carrying the voices of people who are, who are most impacted. Um, yeah. Um, and I would just add, you know, Mary was talking about the fact that it's personal. It's, it's people you know, it's people, it's family, it's friends, it's people in your community. In addition to the education about the, about the realities of, of the risk of, of drug use and, and the realities of people's lives. Also, you know, personal stories, human stories. I don't feel like there's enough out there which actually frames people who use drugs as people, <laughs> you know, that we, we have an absolute avalanche of material, drama material, which frames people who use drugs in the most awful way. And it allows somehow some kind of sense of separation from the fact that these are these are people in your community. These are people who you love or you know, or so I, I and equally we're an HIV charity, but you know, people don't put their problems into these kind of pockets. And so the ability to, I would really welcome the opportunity to talk to people who aren't interested in HIV, but do understand that SSPs are critical and do care about protecting people in their community because there's so much going on right now with COVID, with Black Lives Matter, with climate change, with there's strength in numbers. And to the extent that we, we build coalitions where people across the spectrum are saying, this is something that has to happen. And they're not just from part of one specific interest group or one disease or one, one population, the stronger it is. So um, yeah, more, more or, or not just educating yourself on, on the realities of the opioid crisis, but also about the, the, the experience, the whole person's experience, because that will bring together more people, I feel. Zach, can I throw something out there really quick? Sure. I know we, we pitched that to philanthropy, but I know we have a lot of government folks on the line too, right? Um, you know, one of the things that I know, I know we've, we've, we've repeatedly said, you know, there's a syringe ban and certainly we're all great hopeful, right, that that will soon be lifted. But I wanted to just recognize um, the incredible funding streams that have worked really well through the federal government. Um, and, uh, you know, Dr. Merman, I think you would, I want to thank you and, and the CDC, you know, one of the coolest things I've seen is the cooperative agreement between NASTED and um, Partner AIDS United. One of the things that's really cool about it is, you know, many of the programs that are here today that, you know, only not a lot of them get federal funding, right? Or in a state funding because they don't have the infrastructure to even apply for those grants, right? They're complicated. There's a lot of paperwork. Um, if, you, if you do that secondary level of grant making, right? Like a pass-through grant making through folks like NASTA and AIDS United, it was, um, really powerful to see that not only could it be rapidly deployed in the community, but it was very effectively deployed because there were subject matter experts in it, right? And they also, um, you know, they helped reduce that burden on the community to be able to apply for that grant. And so I think that's really important. So I just wanted to thank you and, um, you know, acknowledge that we've got some funding streams that do work. Um, of course, we're all looking for more. So thank you. And just th thank you also, everyone. I, um... 
Barry, I appreciate all the work that you've been doing. And um, I think you're right. So the question was kind of, if I want to be interested in supporting this, how do I best do it? And I would say, you know, people were very clear. The Syringe Access Fund is fantastic. You know, Age United knows what they're doing. If you want to give them money, they'll do it. Um, I think the other thought is, well, what if I want more direct input? What if I really want to find something in my either geographic area or, or I want to truly support directly a couple of organizations? Well, you can either talk with Jesse and his team about who might need that help in your area, or if it doesn't have to be your geographic area, who might be the best one to meet your interest in the nation. Um, and then the other is, is actually to look at the North American Syringe Exchange Network, or NASIN, which has truly a network of over 400 um, syringe service programs of different sizes and shapes. And, and, and you can kind of figure out where, where would your particular interests and, air, and ability to fund do the biggest good um, and, and can, can kind of work with them. And one thing that CDC is doing is we're trying to more to comprehensively support a network um, so we've been working with Nason and a few other partners to try to say that this is really important. There's there's skills, there's there's social support, there's just there's learning what it means to be an SSP and 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 kind of valuing it at its most minimum type of service provision as well as the more um, I would say elaborate um, service pro providing that we were talking about earlier as a goal for for some but may not be for others. And then. Um, so I, w I think there's a lot of opportunity. It works. And I think as, as Zach had emphasized in the beginning, you feel good. I mean, you're helping people. And I think it's clear that everyone here wants to help people. Yeah, thank you all so much. I want to jump to a question. Um, and I, this one is, is really geared towards our, our first panel. Um, so Rafi, Phoebe, Mark. Um, someone asked, how is it that organizations are meeting the increased demands with decreased funding and decreased support? And kind of as a, as a follow up to that, um, uh, do you think that that, um, does that, that send the message that because you're continuing to meet the demands that you don't need additional resources? And, and have you kind of uh, experienced that, uh, that tension there between that at all? I'm going to jump in right now because I feel this. And I feel this on many different levels. Um, as, as Native people and as Native women, we are expected to carry the water, literally. Our community is, is in an in a entrenched battle against Enbridge because Enbridge since 1952 has cited its, its big old dirty oil pipeline right through our reservation. And it's, I mean, it's, the, the situation is absolutely precarious. Um, and, you know, as a, as, a, as a native woman in this community who's, who's working on taking care of other people, um, you know, we just, I just meet the demand. We just do this. We do this work no matter what. You know, we will be doing this work, but there's an equity issue that has not been addressed. And, um, you know, we, um, we're, we're absolutely committed to this program. And then, you know, it's, it's not just me, it's like our, our, whole, our whole community is absolutely committed to this. But, um, you know, because of, because of the lack of funding, because of policy considerations, I mean, I, I have a, one of our participants, a young woman in our program, she's dealing with a, a you know, some prosecution for paraphernalia for a, um, like a, a jar of syringes. Um, I have another, another part participant in my program who um, was evicted from her public housing unit because she responded to multiple overdoses. She saved lives and that was the basis for her eviction from her public housing unit. And, um, you know, and so, um, we we will continue to to do the work no matter what um you know as as long as we have a dollar we're going to be we're going to be using that towards towards our you know towards the needs of our communities but um we could do so much more if we had greater support great thank you phoebe uh rafi mark anything to add so, so sometimes it does send the wrong message because then we'll figure it out anyways, kind of mindset. Um, we literally scramble for, for other funders, new funders, people who have not been in, in this space. Um, 
before, but but sometimes we need to give less syringes out, um, which translates to increase the risk of transmission of HIV and hepatitis C because there are not enough syringes to go around. That that is a sad truth, right? Um, you you make that plea to the DOH, and you know they, they'll 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 have their response. You and 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 sometimes there is not enough to go around. You need to make ends meet and you talk to literally participants saying like, look, we might not have enough syringes as we did uh, five months ago. And we, you need to be even more careful. So let's, let's have a work plan. And, and, it, and it's sad to say, but sometimes you need to cut down on the amount of syringes that you know somebody needs and, and, and not be able to meet that um, 100% but meet 60%, 70%. That means increased risk. So um, yeah, that, that's not the, the, the so nice side. Other times you do get a funder that says, oh, I didn't know you did that, as I mentioned earlier, says, I will fund that too. I think, I think that's amazing. That's why you bring them in and, and, and show them the entire um, organization and what you do. It's not just about providing syringes, but it's linkage to care, it's case management, it's HIV testing. It's, it's all the spread, right? So, so yeah, that's as honest as, as a as a response and I say, as I can give right now. I think, I think Rafi says it very well. You know, as we're coming to an end, Zach, we talk so much about having the tools to end this epidemic. We talk about in terms of biomedical tools. As, as Dr. Merman said, we've known for 30 years that, that injection sites, SSPs, needle exchange are scientifically proven to stop new infections, but they don't matter if people don't have them. Our getting access to them is what is necessary for ending this epidemic. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I want to, so we have like just a couple more minutes. And before I close this out, I wanted to go around and just give everyone an opportunity to say like one sentence, um, whatever whatever you kind of want to wrap up with, um, it's totally up to you. Um, but we're going to go in the order that folks appear on my screen because I think that's easiest for me at the moment. Um, so it's going to be Jesse and then Mary. So Jesse. Well, I think I may have just stated that, that uh, access to needle exchange and syringe service programs are key to ending the epidemic, and we need to support them now. Thanks, Jesse. Anne? Um, so, you know, as a foundation uh, working all around the world, there is never as much money as you want to do the work that you want. Um, I, I firmly believe, and we take the same view about LGBTQ, when something is criminalized, it reduces your ability to do anything really meaningful over the long sustained term. So um, I, I would I would like, it's been an honor to fund the Syringe Access Fund, but I would also like to offer that where we can, and I think it's one of the values that the foundation has, to lend Elton's voice and to lend our voice to try and De help decriminalize the things that really make all of the work that sits underneath it so much harder to do, not only for us as funders, but for all the wonderful programs, uh, you know, that we've been hearing about from Mark and Phoebe and, and Rafi. That would be my, that would be my pitch and my wish. Thank you. Mary? Um, you know, I think you know, we're, we're coming to this point, right, where the science is there, right? I think right now we need to get over stigma, we need to get over politics. Um, I have seen such tremendous momentum under both the Trump and Biden administration that gives me such great hope um, for our future in terms of policy and, and changes. We also have a lot of work to do, right? So, um, you know, I think I'm kind of balancing a little bit of hope and a little bit of like grit to keep fighting, right? To do what we need to do for the community. But um, with that, I just, I wanted to say thank you. I think more than anything to the people that are in the field. I know we got a lot of the programs on the call today um, for just everything that you've done. And as Anne said, there's there's never enough money um, to do, uh, to, to be able to give as much as we want to. And I'm just grateful for everything that you do. and. Um, and uh, keep fighting because we're all here for you. Thank you. All right, so then we have Daniel, Jonathan, Rafi, Phoebe, Mark. So Daniel. 
hats off to AT United and hats off to the to the opening panelists. Um, I just want to say, um, you know, every crook and cranny, all of us, I hope, who, who participate can talk to other folks who could be potential funders and take what we've learned here. And I want to say for Levi Strauss Foundation, I am a resource and will make myself available to anyone who, who, who would like, you know, any, any feed, feedback or guidance in talking to boards or people who haven't thought about this. Thanks. Thank you, Daniel. Jonathan? Just first, thanks for inviting me. And I, I, uh, I think this is a great uh, team to be working with. I really look forward to um, continuing that uh, collaboration and new ones. I did want to just quickly answer a question that Emily asked in the chat of mm -hmm. me directly, which was related to you know, some of the silos that we are seeing with funding for SSPs and, and you know, kind of what can we do on the ground, particularly um, health departments or you know, SSP programs on the ground, what do we do? And I think the issue is that know that, that there are a lot of opportunities more than people know. So SAMHSA, for example, with their grants, block grants and others can actually fund certain service programs and do in certain areas. But, but the health departments and grantees have to ask for those resources to be used that way. Um, the injury money that comes from a different center than mine at CDC can also theoretically be used, but again, is really asked for. And then uh, of course, within my own center, we have money mostly through our HIV division um, and then a little few other spaces currently, um, one being the um, a little bit more with our viral hepatitis money. Um, we're trying to, again, kind of holistically put things together as a way of supporting a broader range of, of, of benefits. But I think if we knew, if, if you go to your local health departments or grantees of the federal agencies and say to them, I actually think this is possible. When they say it's not possible, then, then, then that actually can sometimes open the door to um, opportunities that people may not even realize exist because it, they're, they're stuck thinking in their, the way that's, um, that has been the way it was previously. Thank you. Uh, so Phoebe? Oh shoot, sorry, I thought it was after Rafi. Um, I just wanna share some feedback from a participant recently. <clears throat> we are so unbelievably, unbelievably grateful for the program because every one of us has had to use the same needle for days, sometimes weeks. You make it easy for us to get the supplies we need. Um, I try to make sure that no one is using a needle more than once. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that, Phoebe. Uh, and Rafi turned his video off, so he went into like the end of the, the group. <laughs> uh, so we'll go to Mark and Rafi, but if you want to jump in, jump in, Rafi. Well, for, for me, really quick, I, I would say get to know harm reduction. You know, I think Daniel Raymond said it real well, uh, which is one of the persons who have been around harm reduction for a while. And he, and he did say harm reduction it was built uh, in a way to respond to hepatitis C, HIV, now overdose, but we're also responding to COVID, right? Because we are that community entrenched. So get to know harm reduction and, and you'll see how, how that they investing in community and SSPs and all the service delivery we do. It's, it's in a way it's revolutionary love. So it's, it's, it's there and, and it's, we, we love the work we do. So that's about it. Thank you, Rafi and Mark. And, you know, and I would add to that you know, not just revolutionary, the return on your investment is far greater with folk that can get the work done. It's far greater with folk who are used to working with nothing to get something and know how to spread those dollars because we appreciate having it, you know, and it gets directly to the person. So, you know, we, we move lighter on our feet and we, we get it done immediately. So it, it's, uh, you know, I know for me, from where I'm sitting, you know, to whom much is given, much is required. So I do this from a standpoint of love uh, and, and the fact that I never saw being in this space. So it's, it, 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 it's just important that it gets back to those that we serve. Yeah. 
Well, thank you all so much. Um, I appreciate those uh, that have stayed on a little late. I appreciate our panelists for staying on a few minutes late. I want to, in, in closing us out, I want to reference something that Anne said about the need for more stories about people who use drugs. When I was putting together my presentation and I was, I was starting to my putting notes in for introducing myself, I had in there to mention that, you know, I am a person that that had problematic and chaotic use over many years of my life. And I took that out. And that was pure stigma saying like, no, in this setting, that's not appropriate. And I took it out and I, I'm putting it back in. And that's because of what you said, Anne, and I appreciate that. I've been someone who has been navigating my own path of recovery for about five years. And, you know, I, when I first started that path, all I knew of was abstinence-based 12-step programs, which work for some people. But then Monique Tula, Paola Berahona introduced me to harm reduction and my world completely changed. And I think that that alone, for me, tells me that, that there's something really, really special here. And um, I appreciate you all so much. I appreciate this community and this field and this work so much. And thank you all. We will be posting a recording of the video on Age United's YouTube channel. Please reach out to me if you have any follow-up questions. I know we got to, we had so many questions we didn't get to get to. So we will try to put some of those to our panelists and see if we can come up with a few answers to share with everyone who is on today's call. Thank you all. Have a wonderful rest of your day and a wonderful rest of your week.